Hello and a very big welcome to Nature Live Online, the show that takes you behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum London. Now today's show is a little different. Instead, we're going to take you behind the lens at our Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition and exhibition, which just opened last week. I'm going to be chatting with one of our photographers, Jennifer Hayes, about her incredible work and finding out a bit more about the story behind her image, A Fragile and Fractured World, winner of the Oceans, the Bigger Picture category, which is a brand new category for our competition. So very, very exciting. I've got lots of questions for Jennifer, but as always, this is your chance to ask questions too. So do post any comments, any questions that you have in the chat. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as we can in the time that we have. Also say hello, tell us where you're watching from. We, we love to hear from you. But let me introduce you to our guest for today. Now, Jennifer is an aquatic biologist and photojournalist. She specializes in freshwater and marine environments. She has travelled the world from the equator to the polar ice. She's descended beneath the Botswana's Okavanga Delta. She's documented remote and wild Cuba. She's even submerged into the fjords of Greenland. Quite a life. I am very excited to be able to chat to her today. So let's give a very big welcome to Jennifer Hayes. Hello, good people. Hello, viewers. Welcome outside my window to the mighty, the great and mighty St. Lawrence River on the Canadian, New York Canadian border. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me, team. It's so, so good to have you, Jennifer. I'm so looking forward to this. You, first off, congratulations. You, you were winner of our inaugural category, Oceans, the bigger picture. Fantastic category, all about highlighting the importance of, of oceans for our planet, uh, which made me wonder, Jennifer, where does your passion for the ocean come from? Well, thank you for for congratulating me on, on the win. Actually, that win goes to the Harp Seals and the team behind it. I'm very, very proud of the team it takes behind every click of the shutter. There's, there's a whole group in Magdalen Island that help. Passion for oceans comes from, I think I, I'm exuberant and I apologize in advance for like talking with my hands and being exuberant and over exuberant and just a chatty cat. I apologize. Curiosity. I am as an, I am as interested in a pond filled with polywogs. And I know this to be a fact now, since I attended a wedding that had next to a pond filled with polywogs and I went back the next day as I am the Pacific. I look out over a body of water, like right now, I'm staring out over the St. Lawrence and I'm wondering, are the muskies out there right now? I'm curious, what is going on underneath? How do things make a living? How do things survive? What do they do in the winter? What don't they do? Do they bury in the mud? Do they eat? Does their metabolism slow down? What's going on? It's this big secret. That's, that's what brings me to any body of water, including the oceans, a stream, a pond, a river, it doesn't matter. And then I want to know. And then I watch and then I document and I'm like, oh, did I just see that? Did I just see that? And then I want to share it with everybody in, in case they're as um, as curious as I am. And they'll be like gobsmacked. That's why. And you're you're a biologist. So how did you uh, get into photography? You know, I don't think it's an uncommon story. It's now that I've listened to a lot of my colleagues, whether it's uh, Nicklin or Payshack or people that are out there, I started as a biologist. I, I think my parents, I grew up on a dairy farm. My, my parents hoped I would marry the guy next door with a big, you know, John Deere tractor, but no, I was like, no, I want to go for zoology and marine biology. What is that? So when you're, and I, and I went on through for a master's and I, and I got into PhD research and you're, you're focused on, on your subject. And in my case at the time, it was sharks for my master's and sturgeon for a PhD. And it was literally um, all about statistics and, you know, p-values and pie charts and, you know, graphs. And I would go to symposiums and I put them up and I'd talk about these incredible animals I was studying. I would talk. I would say, you should see them do this. You should see them, you know, spawn or how ancient they are or when they give birth. And then I said, oh, my God. I'm doing this totally wrong. I flipped it around. I figured out how to take cameras underwater, how to take video. Then on, on the symposiums and on the screen, I was showing ancient sturgeons 100 years old. And I was showing sharks and, and um, back in the early days of finning. 
and and talking and showing the creature the magnificence and then literally just you know talking about the data not putting it up there then the grants began to flow then talks began then i started going into schools with this and making a difference in the next generation how they perceive these animals so it's power of the picture i learned i learned a very i i just very obvious and straightforward way the power of the picture so true a hundred percent true do you think that um looking through a lens alters the way that you you look at the natural world yes i do in many in many many ways um it, it, first off it sometimes it literally hyper focuses i use this word i i don't know if it's a real word so par pardon me it's my word i get hyper focused so that i will be looking at a shrimp or some, maybe um, a cuttlefish ready to hatch from its egg and it's, it's like this big and I'm staring at it for like the last hour and 15 minutes and something crazy town is going on behind me. It might be, well, yeah, it could be whale sharks doing the con or it could be a crocodile from in Cuba's Gardens of the Queens coming up behind me. David's telling me it's there, but here I'm focused on upside down jellyfish. Like, oh my God, look at this jellyfish. Look what I know I had a visitor behind me. Here he is. He hears me. He hears me singing to myself because I do. I hum underwater. And you know, this, um, this American crocodile comes up behind me and just kind of investigates what's going on in its backyard. I wasn't in any danger, by the way, because they're used to snorkelers in the area. David lets me know that I have, I turn around, I see this guy. <laughs> I've, I've diverted back from my upside down jellyfish. I'm like, hello, handsome. Look at you. He stayed approximately 15 seconds, got bored and went downstream in the mangrove to do other crocodile things. So yes, you can get hyper focused or super involved when you're peering through your lens. I also get separated from the moment sometimes and not know you feel like you're invincible behind that camera. Like when you're with sharks, you always, you're a guest in their environment. Sharks, crocodiles, predators, you're a guest. They are symbols of a healthy ecosystem. You want to see them, but you also want to read their single signals and, and know when to get out. And sometimes when you're in that behind that lens, it's like one more photo. Oh my God, if it does this, I'm going to stay and try to get this. But you have to have discipline. Sometimes that discipline is there. Sometimes it's not. And then for me, I, it goes one step further. Sometimes something is so magnificent, it touches your being, it touches your soul. And photographing it feels, it just doesn't feel right. You, I've set the camera down and I've let, I've let whatever that moment is play out and I've just watched and been grateful. I'm not religious, but I, I now know I'm spiritual because of, of those moments where I've said, is this really happening? And you let it fill you. And I had to learn to do that because I learned I was walking away with these moments on, on, the, on the cards and the film and in the video housings, but I didn't have them inside of me. And they were just something to look at. And I said, some things you have to just, you just have to let happen to you. And I have learned to do that. And no, they won't end up in a competition somewhere and they won't end up in a magazine. They're here. And yeah. uh, that's good. I've I've let it happen a couple of times. Yeah. So. It's okay sometimes just to put the camera down and experience it. <laughs> I, I might get yelled at by an editor or get to blame my partner and be like, what the heck are you thinking? And I'm like, yeah, but it's here and it's going to stay yeah. here. Yeah. Now, um, speaking of competitions, let's take a look at your uh, winner from our Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition because it is an absolutely stunning image. Tell us the story behind this, this, this photograph, Gem. What are we looking at here? Well, it is not one of your, you often see pictures of harp seal pups that are snuggly and cuddly. Mm -hmm. These are harp seal pups in a different scenario. The, this is the harp seal herd in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Quebec, above Magdalen Island. This is fractured sea ice that formed on about February 28th and 29th. In about mid-February, the sea ice in 2020 formed, but it was weak and thin because the actual Gulf water temperatures are warming, not just the air, but now the body of water is warming up. The sea ice was, the coverage was limited. 
the thickness was limited. A storm came through and it battered and beat up that ice and it fractured. A few seals had pupped by then and they were separated or possibly lost. But then that ice came back together and it formed this mosaic. Think of your grandmom's quilt. I think when I see this, I think of my grandmother's quilt that has these seams and it's big pieces of ice that are fractured, come back together. The seams are, are frozen pieces of slush that are just basically holding it together, depending on what the day and night ter time temperatures are. The herd found this, desperate to give birth. The herd comes down from the Arctic, wanting to give birth in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They found this fractured ice. They said, this is going to have to do. This is all we have. They got up. They began pupping February 28th and 29th. Helicopters looked long and hard, DFO, and um, <clears throat> other helicopters looked long and hard for this patch of ice. So you're looking at the herd giving birth. The red is the blood or the birth from the blood or the blood from the birth. Sorry. And um, the, the brown sprinkles are the, the adult harp seals. And this is not good sea ice. This is not what you want to see. This ocean's bigger picture is telling us this is a fractured world. They need a stable environment of ice. Harp, why, why is that? Harp seals need ice. Harp seal pups need ice to survive. The whole species does. They are adapted for sea ice, to be born on the sea ice. They literally um, are, the name means ice lovers. And <clears throat> mom will give birth in late February to a pup, she'll nurse that pup 12 to 15 days. She's gonna come back and forth and go off the sea ice. She's gonna socialize with her other, with <laughs> other mothers beneath the ice, come back and nurse the pup. And after 12 to 15 days, she's gonna abandon that pup. And that pup is gonna have tanked up in size. He's gonna become a big, it's just a big fatty old harp seal because it's been nursing on, on mom's rich milk. He's gonna need every ounce of that. She leaves. And he has to stay on that ice. And what happens is he slims down over time, but he needs about four plus weeks, maybe four, that he needs this pulse of time to mature, to learn how to be a harp seal. He's got to figure out how to swim. He's got to figure out what to eat. He's got to figure out how to be a harp seal. And he's got to survive long enough. When they're in this phase, as the white coats are called white coats, when they are, first they're born as yellow coats because they're tinged with amniotic fluid. That goes very fast. They could become white coats for the 12 to 15 days. They are big butter balls. Then they begin to molt after, and that's like insult to injury. Mom leaves and now I'm going to molt. Now I'm going to lose my white coat. And he enters the next phase of his, of his life cycle called the beater phase. When he slims down, he tries to learn to swim. He's in there beating the water, trying to, what am I? How am I supposed to do this? And they have to get back up on stable ice. But what's happening, happening in the last decade is this trend in destabilization of the ice. There's less ice, higher temperatures, lower ice, thinner ice. Storms come through, break it up. It's not good. And this is a story that you have returned to time and again. Why is it? What, why harp seals? What do you find so fascinating about, about these animals? <clears throat> this show's like two hours long, right? Um, <laughs> so David Dubelay and I, my fearless partner, we, we did a story for National Geographic in 2011 on the entire golf ecosystem. Oh my God, it was great. It literally is like a thousand miles down from our dock that juts out in front of me right now. But it was everything from, you know, basically just everything that was in the Gulf. And we encountered the harp seals. We went in uh, February 20, in mid-February. Nope, take it back, March, our phone rang and it was Mario Sear in, uh, in the Magdalene Islands, our, our guide. And he said, Jennifer, David, there's ice. You must come. We're like, no, we weren't scheduled to come until 2012. He said, no, we have ice. We, th it's beginning to, you know, we never know now what we're going to get for ice. So we hustled. We got budget approved. We got down there. We left from PEI by boat. You can go out to the sea ice by helicopter by boat. We, we went out by boat. It took us a few days to find this small patch of ice that had the herd on it, the, the harp seal herd, and we pulled in. And we were gonna be on that ice 24 seven, right in the ice. 
And at night you'd go to sleep rocking in your bunk and you would hear the cries of the harp seal pups wafting through the hall into your dreams. And I'd be like, oh my God, this is incredible. You could put, you could get up in your pajamas, put on your Mustang suit and go out and walk over the ice after dark or at at sunset with a cup of coffee then and be there for sun up and see them at sun up and mom's coming and going. And then, so you're, you're devoting your time to the top side. And then when you feel you've got just about that nailed, you can go underwater and then you see the whole underside of this thing and listen. And you hear, you hear the mothers talking and, and communicating below. It sounds like a, it just sounds like a rainforest. And then it was our last day. This is our last day. We go in the water. We say, well, we've got the story. We have the biology. Let's get in the water. David finds his seal here. I go looking for mine. I find mine peering in the water like this. He looks at me. You're not my mom. Mom is behind me. This is mom. Meet mom. She's not <laughs> happy. I'm between her and a pup. And she comes around and she meets the pup at the edge of the ice and greets him with this nose to nose kiss of recognition. Mwah! Are you my mom? Are you my pup? And she calls him into the water and she's going to move him off his piece of ice to another piece. She's going to, she says, all right, we've got a, we've got somebody here in the water with us. I don't know what it is. And she's going to move him. And his ice was very small. So it was not a bad decision on her part. So we're swimming along and you always let wildlife come to you. You never force wildlife and we're swimming along and mom is keeping like one eye on me literally at all times i'm keeping a, an appropriate distance the pup wants to come see me he's trying what is she i want to go see her what is she, what is that mom's literally with her flipper no you are not going to go see that crazy lady with a camera and we're swimming and after minutes of going along slowly and pacing ourselves she relaxes, the pup relaxes, the situation, I'm still shooting. She drops back. She's still keeping stink eye on me and she's watching her pup, but the pup is like, okay, I'm getting a little closer. We're still moving on. I'm getting a little closer. Then he gets very close <laughs> to where I am and he actually gets up to my elbow. Now the pup is here at my elbow. He scrabbles up onto my chest and mom starts circling me. The pup is using me as a raft. It's resting, looking around, touching my face mask. Mom is going around, giving me more stink eye. Pup rolls off and then <clears throat> mom goes up. This is the pup coming up to me, getting close. The pup rolls off and mom checks him out stem to stern. Did anything happen to you? Did she do anything to you? Are you okay? So she's watching the pup and checking him out. And I'm clicking like a madman thinking, oh my God, I've got a mother and a pup. This is a great embrace. And it's a half and half. And it's the last day. And this is, and then I felt a nip on my left ankle. And then a nip on my right ankle. And I look down and I see this carousel of male harp seals below me, 20, 30, 20 feet below. And I think that's okay. They're down there. Then just as that thought went through my neurons. One, a male came up over my head. His body friction took off my, my mask and my snorkel and it began to drop and I got it and I grasped it and I smooshed it back on my face and I had water and mucus in it and I could kind of see him out there below me and he turns around and he's looking at me like this about 10 feet below. He's going to come again. And I get, and I'm like, oh, this might not be good. <laughs> and uh, I felt this blur uh, I saw a blur and I felt this pulse of water go by. Woof. And it was the female. She went down and beat the crap out of the male. There was a tumble and a, you know, just a ball of flippers and bubbles and mucus. And, and the pup came over to my shoulder and we're looking down and we're watching this thing. And, you know, I'm watching. And then the male swims off. Mom comes up, slow blowing these big giant bubbles. I'm like, this might not be good. She comes up and she checks her pup again. She does that stem to stern thing where she's, you know, nose to nose and, and are you okay? Are you good? And then she starts to shove the pup through the water using her nose, her whole body. She's nudging him. I see where we're going. We're in open water now. And she's taking him to back to the ed edge of the ice. And she stops a few feet away from me. She stops and she comes back and she gets me. She nudges me with her head. 
and her body and her flipper. And, and now I'm side by side with a, with a pup and she nudges us both to the edge of the ice and they go down a lead. There's an opening about the width of a normal door. She's taking the pup there. I watch him disappear around the corner and I duck around her and I, I'm emotional. I have to urinate worse than I've ever had to. I'm so cold. I don't know my own name. I put the camera up on the edge of the ice. I'm going to go take off my weight belt and a male unknown if same male comes under the edge of the ice and he bites me square in the groin bang and he lets go and then he bites me bang square in the thigh and he lets go and before i knew it with my weight belt on about 15 ish pounds i'm up on on the sea ice like i've never done that before Okay, we know why the male did what it did, because I was swimming with his girlfriend. He's pumped sure. up on testosterone. He has, he's, yeah, that's textbook. Why the female did what she did? Why that mother harp shield did what she did? I don't know. I'm a skeptic about these things. For it to happen to me, miracle. Because as a biologist, I'm kind of like, you know, I pick up my cup of coffee when I read these, the dolphin save me stories. Yeah. And so, you know what? This stuff happens. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. So captain, very angry. Cause I had dis disappeared into the ice with this harp sail mother and pup and I followed it and I broke, I broke the don't swim alone law and he's mad. And he's like, we have a storm coming. We have to get in through the gangplank down. I get back up on the boat. He's like, we have to go to port. We get back. We go through raging seas. The winds blow in the ice and the water's pitching. We get out of the pat. We get out of the sea ice, get back to Prince Edward Island. We're tying up, we're unloading, we're loading up the car to come back to our home in Clayton, New York. And um, the radio buzzes and our guide comes over and he says, it's good we got out of there because the ice pack demolished. And I said, what are you saying? And he said, it's demolished. And I said, what happened to the seals? He said, they're gone. And I said, what do you mean they're gone? He said, they're gone. I said, gone, gone where? And he said, they, they drowned or they were pulverized. All the seals that we had worked with on that loose ice and including the one that I had just worked with um, hours before had perished. You ask why I go back. Right then, this became engraved on my being. I stood in that parking lot, stupefied, gobsmacked, pick a word. I drove a thousand miles home with David Dubois saying like six words, staring out the window, unable to comprehend it. And so we know there's a trend of less and less ice and golf. One, you know, in some years they get stable ice enough for them to survive, but the overall trend are higher temperatures in both the, both ambient and, and sea temperatures. And the other trend is declining ice. And the platforms are thinning and thinning and more, vul more vulnerable to storms. So you ask why I go back. A story, we often leave stories behind and they stay on the page. Some stories stay with you. This story, this story is engraved on, on my being. And I go back now every year that the ice allows. And sometimes the ice, there's not enough. In 2020, or no, 2021, there was no ice. No wow ice not that i could get there because of covid but there there was no ice and i think another year 20 sometimes there's on occasion there's superb ice or to you know just incredible ice as it should be mm -hmm. um and you could walk for miles on the ice but the trend again is declining yeah unfortunately um and you know with a story like this you you sometimes have some really difficult decisions to make particularly in terms of um, whether to, to intervene or, or to do you try to remain a, a, a kind of a detached observer? You want to be as a journalist, as a documentarian, photographer, pick, pick, pick the category you want to be, mm -hmm. want to fall into. You want to bring every voice to the table, even the voices you might, that might not agree with your opinion. You have to bring the voices to the table and the story and let the story be the story for, for, for much of the time. And in 2020, I was faced with um, a dilemma. I Part of this story are the deaths of the harp seal. This, I, this is long form journalism taken to the extreme for me. It's like 10 years. 
of a decade of going up in very long form. I'm embedded in this story and part of it is death and the dying and the crushing up. It's hard to be out there in the middle of a raging storm to document the pulverization. It's hard to be there, especially when the platforms are breaking up, but it's part of the story. The last day in 2020 for us, we go out by helicopter. We find very, it's hard to find a piece to land on because it was breaking up. We find a piece and, and I find a pup that's in heavy slush and it's drowning. It's struggling, it's exhausted. It stops, it sinks, it struggles to the surface. Um, it floats and then it, it just gives up. And I got in, I made the decision to get in. I said, this is a pup that isn't going to make it. It's struggling. It doesn't have enough energy to get back up on the edge of the ice. And I said, well, that time has come. Here's this picture of death I'm about to make and video. I get in, the pup immediately sensed my presence and it immediately sensed <clears throat> that I was something more solid than the ice around it. And you, it scrabbled very fast towards me and it climbed right up on my chest and it just lay down and was exhausted. Its heart was pounding and it had found state, it had found stability and it wasn't trying to cling to life. It was clinging to me. So then I had to make this decision. Behind me is open water where I have to go to anyway to get out. I struggle in that slush. It is hard to swim with. It is deep slush and you can't swim normally and it costs more energy. I have to make this decision. Do I go vertical in the water and let that pup fall backwards and document the death that was going to play out when I got in and not let the pup find find solid ground on me and just document the death? Or do I let it stay where it is, swim where I'm going to swim to anyway for myself to get out and raft it out to better water? I swam. We swam. I took him out to open water. We rafted. I let him get his breath back. And when he was ready, he rolled off and he got to the edge of the ice and he got up. So that was my decision. I swam with a pup on my chest and it survived for however much longer it was going to survive. But as a journalist, I, I was in that ice making that decision. But for me, truthfully, it wasn't a decision. Someone else might have made another decision. But my deci it chose me. It got up on me without my help. I, had, I, did, I went exactly where I had to go to get out. And it needed that moment of rest. It got it. And it was able to get back on solid ice and, mm -hmm. and survive until at least the ice really broke up. So. Yeah. Incredible, incredible story. We are almost out of time, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I, I want to get in a, just a couple more questions. Um, what do you hope uh, people will take away from, from seeing images like this? <clears throat> Connectedness, whether you live in Kansas or you live coastal, we're all connected every second breath. That's my phrase. It's many phrases. We're all connected to the oceans. As the oceans go, so do we. What I really want to squeeze in here to people viewers, good people, you are invited to the harp seals. You don't have to be a BBC discoverer or National Geographic photographer. You can go. You don't have to put on a dry suit and snorkel. There is an eco, there is a very solid ecotourism base there that takes you out. You base in a hotel, a single hotel there. Um, you, you go out to the ice, you get off, they provide Mustang suits and you meet this face, you meet this incredible pulse of life. You understand what it's like to be a creature that that needs ice to survive. And then you go back to your hotel and you have a whole nother set of dreams, maybe, that say, um, you know, how am I connected to this planet and how do the choices I make make a difference? So you are invited late February, early March. Think about meeting the face of climate change. Go to the sea ice. I am absolutely sold. An amazing opportunity. And in case, just in case anyone isn't, I, I want to um, end with a, one final video of yours, Jen, just to take people into the world of the harp seal. So let's play that just now.
Just wonderful. Jennifer, thank you so much. We are sadly out of time. There is there is so much more to talk about, but it's That's been, okay. Because I'll see you on the ice. Exactly. I'll see you. I'll see you exactly. I will talk more. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much for, for telling us all about these wonderful um, animals and, and showing us your, your fantastic photography and, and, and videos. It's been a wonderful to talk to you. I hope that we can talk to you again, but we will sadly have to say goodbye to you for now. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for helping share the story. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you, team. And thank you to you, our viewers, for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed that show as much as I did. Wonderful, wonderful stories. Do join us again next week. We're going to be exploring some awkward relations. Christina, uh, my colleague, is going to be chatting with scientist uh, Natalie Cooper about how closely related animals can look very, very differently. So don't miss that show. Also, if you're interested in our wildlife photographer competition, tickets are now on sale. Do go and see it. You can see Jen's wonderful image and many, many more. Or check out our website, our online gallery as well. There should be a link coming up in the chat. But we'll say goodbye for you for now. Take care. We hope to see you next time.